Okay, we're looking at uh, 1 John chapter 2, 28 through, down through chapter 3, 24, that large section. We're almost finished with that section. And in that section, John focuses on the ethical component of abiding in Christ. The fact that remaining in him involves continuing to live out one's faith. That's part of that. In the first half, he stresses that abiding of that section, he stresses that abiding in Christ involves right living. And then in the second half of that section, chapter 3, verse 11 through verse 24, he becomes more specific with regard to the kind of righteous living he's talking about. And he focuses on uh, abiding in Christ involves loving one another. And he's focusing on that. Now, when we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 3, verse 23, so almost through the section. And in 323, he says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he gave commandment to us. And as I pointed out last week, it's a singular commandment. He says, This is his commandment, and it has two parts. The first part of the commandment is to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, meaning to believe what John's opponents denied, what the secessionists or the heretics denied. That is that God the Son became the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. Or in Rensberger's phrase, this involves confessing this full incarnational Christology. So when he's talking about believing, when he says believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, there's more loaded into that. It is believing what these heretics denied, that God the Son became the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. And then the second part of this singular commandment is to love one another, and that's where I want to pick back up. The love component of this commandment, it encompasses a multitude of duties. It's an umbrella requirement. And I've said this in many other contexts. The fundamental ethical requirement for the Christian, the center, the bullseye, the heart of Christian ethics is love. And you can see that in Matthew 7, 12 with the golden rule. You can see it in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. You can see it in Romans 13, 8 through 10. But some specific conduct is loving and other conduct is not. You see, in our society and culture, we tend to think, well, it's all about love and that love is just this amorphous blob that has no content. It's an empty vessel into which I can pour any conduct as long as I say it's love. Well, that's not how it is. Love has objective content to it. Some, con some conduct is loving and other conduct is not. Love is the center, but there are definite requirements on how love expresses itself. And that's why I say love is an umbrella requirement. As Paul indicates in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, he says it perfectly. He says, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment. The commandments he's talking about from the law, from the Mosaic law, the commandments, all of these things and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So you cannot say, I love my neighbor and sleep with his wife. Oh no, but we're in love. And love is all that matters. You see, love has content to it. It's an umbrella commandment. See, so Paul here, this command to love your neighbor as yourself, it encompasses the commands of the law, not to commit adultery, not to murder, not to steal, not to covet, and other commands that he doesn't specify. So the Christian is not under the Mosaic law in the sense of being under that set of laws, that unit of laws, that group of laws. But there are laws in there that have ongoing applicability and they do find their fullest expression in the new covenant. And this center of Christian ethics that is love, these commandments apply because that is the sum of them. Just what Paul is saying there. You know, you see that. It's this ongoing moral law centered in love 
That's what Paul means when he speaks of the law of Christ. As he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 9.21, Galatians chapter 6.2, especially if we look at Galatians 6.2 with Galatians 5.14. So that's it. So he, he says here in this, this, this commandment, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, to have this conviction of who Jesus is, that's something that's essential, and then also to love one another. And with that come a lot of these other commandments. And he says here in, in verse 24, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him, and in this we know that he abides in us from the spirit whom he gave to us. So all who keep God's commandments, now plural. Okay, those who keep God's commandments, plural, see, which are subsets of or are encompassed by the commandment of faith and loving one another. All who keep those commandments abide in him and he abides in them. And the implication is what? That those who do not keep those commandments do not abide in him and he does not abide in them. You see, that's, that's the, the opposite side of that. John Stott. Stott says that abiding in God is not a mystical experience which anyone may claim. And this is what you see so much in our society. This idea that I live in rebellion to God. I live in a way that God, you know, he disapproves of it. But God and I are fine because I have this kind of emotional, mystical sense that God and I are okay. Well, that's not what it's about. You know, you don't get to make up Christianity just because it's the religion you want. This is how I wish it was. Well, we have to see what it is. And this is what Estat says. It's not a mystical experience, which anyone may claim. It's indispensable accompaniments are the confession of Jesus as the Son of God come in the flesh and a consistent life of holiness and love. Now, this isn't a surprise. John has beat this drum throughout. And he's done it in the context of these false teachers who are trying to say something different and therefore are threatening the community. So Stott says that. I, Howard Marshall, in his commentary, he says, It is noteworthy that in chapter 2, verse 6, we were told that the person who lives in him ought to walk as Jesus did. Now we're told that the person who obeys his commands lives in him. Later we shall read that if we love one another, God lives in us. It would seem to follow that obeying God's commands is not so much the condition of living in him as rather the expression of our spiritual life. Yet this expression may fail to appear with the result that our spiritual life is in jeopardy and therefore we can be commanded to obey God's commands. Spiritual life and obedience are thus two sides of the one coin. And I think that's right. I've tried to make that point, you see, that being in Christ Loving God, serving Him, being a disciple manifests itself in your life. You cannot refuse to live in submission to God and claim to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, I've talked before about, does that mean perfectly and all that? I only say that again because some other people are in here. I've said it ad nauseum. Okay, so we, we understand that. But that's different, you see, than not really being serious about living out your discipleship. So Marshall says that. Now the consequences of abiding are spelled out elsewhere. In chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, consequence of abiding what? Eternal life. Eternal life. Chapter 2, verse 28, a, con a, a consequence of abiding is we have confidence at his second coming. It's the difference between confidence and shame. If you abide in him, what do you have? Eternal life. If you abide in him, what? It's the difference between being ashamed because I've denied you and rejected you and with confidence because I'm yours. So those are the consequences that he's talked about. Now, John says in the second part of verse 24, he says that he and his readers know that God abides in them from or by the spirit God gave to them. But he doesn't explain how the spirit they received produces that knowledge. You see, he says that we, we know that God abides in us by the Spirit of God He gave us. But how do we know that by the Spirit that He gave us? And I think what he means is that they know God dwells in them. They know that because His Spirit dwells in them. And they know His Spirit dwells in them because unlike the false teachers, they confess the truth 
about Jesus, as we'll see in chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 and verse 6, and they exhibit Christ-like behavior, as we see in chapter 2, verse 29, and chapter 3, verse 9. In other words, I think the Spirit confirms His presence in certain ways, and by His confirmed presence, they know God abides in them. Let me read to you what Stephen Smalley says in his commentary. He says, John's criterion of spiritual confidence, we can be sure that he lives in us by the spirit he has given us, may seem too inward and subjective after the practical teaching of verses 16 to 23. Right? I mean, he's talking about you need to be living this way, living this way, these objective markers of your abiding. And then he talks about the spirit. So you could say, well, does that mean somehow I have this sense and that that's the, t the key? Well, he goes on, he says, however, the Spirit, according to John, manifests himself objectively in the life and conduct of the believer, inspiring true confession of Jesus, as we'll see in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and enabling his followers to act righteously. For example, in chapter 2, verse 29, and lovingly, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Obedience is both the condition and expression of dwelling in God, and the creative gift of the Spirit provides us with factual evidence of that abiding. I think that's how it works out. I think that we have the Spirit's presence in our lives confirmed by how He manifests in our lives. And part of how He manifests in our lives is through the orthodox confession that Jesus is God the Son manifested in the historical person Jesus of Nazareth. He's God incarnate. And in our conduct, our living righteously, particularly in our loving the faithful, loving the orthodox, loving those who are of God. So I think, see, so in those things, so you see both he points to the objective things, and then he shows that the Spirit is the force that produces those things in our lives. I think that's what he's talking about. Now, in chapter, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. In this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ having come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. Indeed, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that it is coming, and now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because the one in you is greater than the one in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world listens to them. We are of God. The one who knows God listens to us. The one who's not of God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. In verse 1, see John's opponents, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. See, John's opponents, these secessionists, that I spent a long time in the very first class explaining who they are, but these heretics, these people who have gone out from the uh, community of faith, they also claim to have the Spirit of God and to speak in His name. This is something they claimed. Indeed, they saw themselves as more, in, more spiritual. They saw themselves as more enlightened than the faithful, than the orthodox community, those to whom John is writing. They saw themselves as more enlightened. They were vessels or oracles of divine truth. And I've said heretics always present themselves that way. They never come and say, I'm a heretic. I am unorthodox. They don't do that. They always come and say, I have greater insight. I have gleaned deeper truth. I am an oracle or vessel of divine truth, and I'm sharing it with you. That's how they always operate. Now, John, he commands his readers not to be gullible. Not to be gullible. Not to believe that everyone who claims to be representing God who claims to be speaking on God's behalf, not to believe that they're actually doing so. See, on the contrary, he says that many false 
prophets have gone out into the world. You see, just because somebody claims to be the voice of God, claims to be presenting the truth of God, you don't swallow that and take that at face value. He says you have to test these things because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And when he says gone out into the world, he may be speaking generally, that there are many false prophets that have gone abroad and are out. But if he is, I think there's at least a secondary allusion to the false teachers who had gone out into the world in the sense of the enemy camp. You see, the, the community of faith and the world, that which is opposed to God, that these people had come from within the Orthodox community, within the church, and then had gone out into the world. They had gone into the enemy camp from within the faithful church. And John speaks of their not believing and not testing spirits rather than speaking of their not believing and testing the false prophets themselves. Now, what's up with that? What I think he's talking about, he says that because demonic powers ultimately are behind the false prophets. See, what they're selling, what they're urging the believers to swallow is they try to pull them into their heresy. What they are selling has its origin in evil spirits. It has its origin in those spirits opposed to God. As Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. They're going to abandon the faith, paying attention to teachings of demons. Do you think Paul means that a demon is going to manifest himself? And go, <laughs> or do you think he's talking about that there is a way the demonic realm is able to insert into the human stream the ideas and thoughts it wants put in there? He doesn't explain. What's the mechanics of that? What is the mechanics of going from the spirit realm where these demons are able then to use humans as their spokesmen? He doesn't tell us that. But it seems they are able to put into our world the thoughts that they want. And I think that's why he's saying, so when you're weighing the false teachers, he puts it in terms of ultimately what you're testing are the spirits that are animating them, the spirits that are behind them. Now, there are, of course, uh, several warnings in the New Testament about false prophets operating in and around the Christian community. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus describes false prophets as wolves in sheep's clothing. You see, they appear to be innocent, and they appear to be part of the group. Right? I mean, that's the whole idea of sheep's clothing. They look like, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just like one of you, and I'm over here. But what are they really? They're deadly. You see, they are deadly. And yet they appear to be something the contrary. Peter tells his readers in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, that there will be false teachers among them who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. So you have a number of warnings about false prophets, false teachers operating in and around the Christian community. There is a spiritual war going on. There's a spiritual war. You see, there's, there's this war that's going on. As Paul famously said in Ephesians 6, 12, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, I know we don't, we don't think about that. And in fact, sometimes we're embarrassed to say it. In, you know, enlightened Western society of the 21st century, you believe me, demons? Wow. People say, yeah, I do. Working. And so this, you see Paul saying there's this spiritual war going on, and a large weapon in the enemy's arsenal is false doctrine and false teaching. This is just a fact. That's why Paul in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, he said that an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Why do you think that is such a fundamental aspect of an elder's role? 
It is because the flock is threatened by false teaching. And so they have to know Christian theology and orthodoxy well enough to identify it, call out those who are threatening it, and stop it. So this is, this is part of the enemy's arsenal. Of course, not all erroneous teaching is heresy. Okay? It's not all heresy. It's not all heresy that threatens one's spiritual life. That doesn't mean that some doctrinal errors are trivial or they're, they're, that they're insignificant. No aspect of God's will is trivial or insignificant. It doesn't mean that. It means that there are things that are more central, more fundamental than other things. And as we grope together for the whole counsel of God, errors about central or fundamental things, see, true heresies, they have to be dealt with decisively. We can wrestle with other things, you see, and tolerate that and teach and do this kind of thing. But heresies, well, what are, what are the listing? Well, you know, that's, that's difficult. Like with so many things, things fuzz at the borders. You, know, you can spot them, well, that's clearly heretical, that's heretical. And the further you get away, you say, well, is that? Mm, all right, that's where wisdom is required. But the concept is there are things that are heretical. There are other things that are part of God's will that are not so central or fundamental. doesn't mean they're trivial. doesn't mean that we ignore them. But there is a difference here. Now, rather than gullibly believing the false teachers who claim to speak from God, John commands his readers to test their representations. I see people fanning, so what I'll do is this. Of course, that doesn't change anything. It's just psychological. It stays right there, but you'll feel cooler in a second. That's right. All right he, he commands, he, he, he tells them, look, rather than just swallowing what they're saying, he commands them to test their representations. Now, that's similar to Paul's command in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. And then in the following verses, John gives them a testing criterion for their situation. So he's telling them, don't be gullible, don't so but test the representations. And then in the next verses, he gives them a testing criterion. He says, in this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus having come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. Of course, when he says did not confess Jesus, he means from the preceding verse, does not confess Jesus having come in the flesh. You see, this, is, this is the testing criterion for their situation. That's always important to understand, okay? He says, indeed, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard that it is coming and now already is in the world. See, the acid test that is relevant to their situation is whether the teacher or prophet confesses Jesus having come in the flesh. The one who doesn't confess the true incarnation, that full incarnational Christology, the one who doesn't confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, that person who doesn't have that true incarnational Christology of the eternal Christ, God the Son being manifested in the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, that person you see referring to the false teachers, right? That person is speaking by the spirit of the Antichrist. All claims to the contrary notwithstanding. So here we have these people saying, you know, we've transcended, we've seen deeper truth, uh, you know, that was okay maybe for a start, but now we understand that really what counts is the spirit and our release from it and all that stuff, and God doesn't care how you live and all of these kinds of things. And they're saying this and saying, by the way, Jesus, no, no, Jesus isn't really God. That makes no sense. I mean, the spirit is detached from this evil material world. So it, 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 maybe it seemed like Jesus actually came. You remember all these things I talked about, about the, the, the errors of the false teachers. Well, see, in saying this stuff, so then they say, but we're of God. And he says, no, they're not. They're, that's the acid test. These people who are telling you they are of God, the very fact they deny the incarnation, that's it. I don't care what else they say. You know, what other tricks they have? What other shiny things they can show you? 
When you hear that, that's it. That's the acid test. When you hear them, them denying that. You see, and John refers to every spirit that confesses or does not confess. Talking about, see, the rational cognitive element of a person by which confession is made. You see, that's the, that's the inner person, the rational cognitive element. And he says that, that every spirit that confesses or does not confess. Now, why does he speak that way instead of saying every person? And I think it's probably because the heretics focus on the spirit if I'm reading their heresy correctly. You see, they focus on the spirit, this sense that, this pre-gnostic sense, that what really matters is the spiritual, the Material is just dross. It's all evil and bad and, and stuff, and we're going to be freed from the material. So God doesn't care about it. So, so he sits here and he says, listen, you want to talk about spirits? I'm telling you that every spirit that doesn't confess Jesus having come in the flesh, that person's being animated by the enemy. That's who's behind him, you see. In making or refusing to make that confession about Jesus having come in the flesh, one acts under the influence of the divine spirit, those who make the confession, or under the influence of the enemy. And so he's letting them see, no, this is a stark thing. Here in uh, uh, Colin Cruz, in his commentary, he says, in, 20, in 218 and following, the secessionists, that's the false teachers who seceded from the faithful community, were identified as antichrists, who had already gone out into the world. Here in 4.3, the secessionists are said to be activated by the spirit of the Antichrist, of whose coming the readers had already heard as part of common early Christian teaching to which the author has already referred in 2.18. The spirit of Antichrist, the author says, is even now in the world and active in people like the secessionists who are now part of the world, that is, these people who are motivated by those desires which are not of God. And that's who they are. And the world has them. There are voices and influence, is influences and countless things pulling you, pulling your children, trying to get them away from the truth of who Jesus is in all kinds of ways, clever ways, just pulling, pulling, pulling. And here we have overt teachers coming in the name of Jesus, spreading lies and trying to pull the people that way. It reminded me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, Paul, you see there in, in that section, he dichotomizes the world, divides the world into two. He dichotomizes it into opponents, Jesus be cursed, and disciples Jesus is Lord. And he does that to make the point that the presence of the Spirit in one's life is a function of one's relationship with Christ. Those who denounce Christ, they do not speak by, meaning they do not have the Spirit. Those who confess Jesus' Lordship speak by, meaning they have the Spirit. So it's this idea of the Spirit is connected to this confession to the orthodox, and he just divides the world into two. And I see that same thing going on here. Again, the test can't be divorced from its context. That's why I said he gives here the acid test that is relevant to their situation. John's speaking to that specific situation. He's speaking here to, and he assumes certain things in that. Can one confess Jesus having come in the flesh and then promote a different heresy? Well, sure. Right? I mean, what about the Judaizers? Their thing wasn't Christology. Their thing was, no, if you want to be right with God, you have to be a Jew. You have to come under the Mosaic law and submit to the entire corpus of Mosaic law. You have to live like an Israelite, live like a Jew from the Old Covenant. And that was not true. But it wasn't a Christological thing. See, so he's speaking into this particular situation. He says in verse 4, oh, should have kept going with Cruz, huh? The aim of the, anti of the Antichrist is to deceive people by denying the truth about Jesus Christ, and in particular within the context of verse 1, by denying the true humanity of Christ, 
that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh. As Strecker notes, evil reveals itself in false teaching. I should have read that earlier, but I didn't. All right. He he says here, verse, verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because the one in you is greater than the one in the world. He tells them, look, that they have overcome them. He reassures his readers, you see, as those who confess Jesus having come in the flesh. They are those who make that confession. They are the Orthodox community. And he reassures them that they are of God. And you've seen throughout he does this. He reassures them, reassures them, well, what's he doing? Well, it's always good to be reassured as a Christian, but I think what is particularly motivating in here is when you're threatened by false teachers who tell you that you don't really get it and that if you really want to be with God, you will come and embrace their heresy, it can disturb your peace because you begin to think, well, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I am. So your assurance gets rattled And then that is the way in to giving you, so you will pay more attention to them and they can pull on you more. But he he reminds them that they have overcome or conquered the false teachers. When he says here, you're of God and have overcome them, he reminds them that they are the Orthodox community and that they have overcome the false teachers, which is probably a reference to the fact that they had resisted the temptation to swallow the false doctrine that they were selling. So here they had come, they had had some success, presumably, but you had other people who stood firm. And these people are telling, no, 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 we're the enlightened ones, you need to follow us, follow us. And they said, baloney. You see, so he lets them know they had conquered or they had overcome them and they were able to gain this victory because the one in them, that's a reference to God. You can see that in chapter 2, 5, and 6, 324, 412, 415. That's a reference to God. The one who is in them is more powerful than the one in the world, referring to Satan, the inspiring force of the Antichrists. See, so the one in you, God, he says here that he's more powerful than the one in the world. And though they had a role to play in the victory, you see, they had a role to play in it. John warns them not to be taken in by false teachers in 2.24 and 2 John 7.11. You see, he warns them. Not to, so, so they had a role to play, but the, the victory was won ultimately by the power of God in their lives. See, to him be the glory. You see, it's not their letting God protect them that gets the glory. It is God protecting them who deserves the glory. They simply let God protect them. Now, some wouldn't. You see, but he puts it in terms of it It was God in you. Your victory over those false teachers, your standing firm, which they had something to play. That's why he keeps warning them. But the fact they stood firm, they don't take the credit for it. You stood firm because you allowed God to protect you from the heresy. Who's glorified and who's praised? This is how all of Christian living is, isn't it? As you and I are transformed by the Spirit of God to be more like Jesus, do we boast of anything? Do we say it is because I had to let go more and allow the Spirit to manifest more in my life that the fruit that He produces is my doing? Or is it to God's glory that He is the one who is producing in us these things? So that as we become more like Jesus, he, he is praised. It's not that, boy, you're really something. You know, you're really a great guy. No, it's a, you see this same principle that works throughout Christian discipleship. In verse 5, he says, They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world listens to them. See, the false teachers have cast their lot with the world. They belong to the enemy camp. They've, they've, they're all in to the point of recruiting people to the enemy camp. They've cast their lot there, and as a result, they speak from the world, from the enemy camp's perspective, rather than from God's perspective, and they have a following within that camp, within the world. They speak from the world's perspective, rather than God's, and they have a following in that camp, in the world. 
And I think what John is doing, he's discounting the significance of the fact the false teachers that they had achieved a following. You know, sometimes when there's a following, well, they can look at all the people. You turn on the channel, TV. You have people who are preaching nonsense with stadiums that are full. Just preaching health and wealth junk. And you go, what, what is going on? You know, you teach six people. And they got 6,000. You see, so I think what John is doing, I think he's discounting the significance of the fact that they had achieved a following by pointing out that gaining adherence is not necessarily proof that one's message is approved by God. It may only be a sign that the message being preached is palatable in the world. You see, you can get an audience by saying all kinds of stuff. You can get an audience by tickling people's ears. You see, saying what they want to hear. And health and wealth is that way. Christianity is an investment project. You want a Cadillac? You want a nice house? Get on board, and God will pay you well for serving him. All right, well, the people, wow. You mean I can, get, I can get rich? I can get out of debt? Man, that sounds like a good deal. I think I'll try it out. All right. Well, you, you see, and I think that's what John's doing. He's discounting this idea, you know, that, that somehow that's what's, what's at work. In verse 6, he says, We are of God. The one who knows God listens to us. The one who's not of God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. See, in contrast to the false teachers, John and his readers are of God. And those who are in fellowship with God continue to heed the true teaching about Christ. They remain with John's community. They remain part of the faithful church. They continue to stand strong. Now, those who join up with the heretics, those who heed the heretics' words rather than John's words. Because John can't be plainer, can he? He cannot be plainer than saying these people are demonic they're antichrists. They are away from God. They are a spiritual death trap. Well, the people who heed what the false teachers are saying and blow John off don't listen to what John is saying. They reveal that they are not if they ever were. And that's a question he doesn't explore. But they re reveal that they are not if they ever were animated by or under the controlling influence of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. You see, if they were animated by and under the controlling influence of the spirit, then they wouldn't be heeding what these people are saying. See, rather, they're animated by the evil spirit, the spirit of falsehood. And as I mentioned in chat, when talking about chapter 2, verse 19, the act of leaving the faithful church demonstrates that one is not at that time, if one ever was, part of it. You see, he points out the very fact that they joined up, they left us, seceded from us, no longer love the faithful, or out saying these things, that shows and shows conclusively that they are not part of us. Now, that doesn't mean that the faithful are immune from all harmful effects of false teaching. Otherwise, John wouldn't be warning them. You see, if you can just say, well, I'm of God, I'm immune. You see, if that were the case, he wouldn't over and over again be warning them about the danger, about warning them not to be deceived. It means that one who goes over to the secessionist is not at that time a disciple, not at that time a true believer. Now, whether he previously had been a true believer or whether he was a phony all along, you see, who, whether he was a true believer who was, who was eventually pulled by the, by the, uh, from the faith by the corrupting effect of the heresy, or whether he was a phony, he just doesn't address that. 4, 7 to 12. I'm trying to pick up a little bit so we don't go and use up July for this thing. People are going, archaeology in the Bible, eh? Okay. 4, 7 to John, 4, 7 to 12. Beloved, let us love one another. because bell's going to ring in a second. Let us love one another because love is of God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one, who, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this is love of God. I'm sorry. In this, the love of God was manifested among us, 
that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and the love of Him is perfected in us. Now here, we have further discussion on loving one another. You see how central this is and what a key aspect this is for John in identifying these people as dangerous heretics. The fact they do not love the faithful. They do not love the orthodox. They do not love your brothers and sisters. You see, that's a, the that's a thing that's very important. He says in 4, 7, 8, I'll just keep talking until the bell rings. He says in 4, 7, 8, let us love one another because love is of God. He urges them to love one another on the basis that love is of or from God as they are of or from God. He just said in verse 6, we are of God. Ah, I knew it was coming. Next week, Lord willing. Thank you for coming.